morning. Um, okay, so we're kind of going to shift gears a little bit here and talk about something uh, new and different. And uh, uh, for a little while, we're going to uh, talk a bit about physics, which we kind of have left off for significant portions of time. Um, and what we're going to talk about is uh, uh, our rigid bodies, okay? Um, you know, we kind of have some idea what a rigid body is, and we've been throwing around the term rigid body uh, and drawing cartoons of rigid bodies and talking about their uh, configurations and velocities and stuff like that. But we haven't actually said yet what a rigid body is because a rigid body is more than just something that moves. Um, it has um, inertial properties. So, so that's what we're gonna uh, uh, talk about now. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna jump out and give you the definition of a rigid body. <clears throat> okay, so a rigid body is uh, two things. Um, it's a B and a mu, so B uh, is a, a compact subset of R3, okay? So if we think of a rigid body as being an object, um, uh, so this means that our um, set of points occupied by our body, that's how you should think about what B is. And so, you know, I'm not going to allow rigid bodies that, you know, shoot off to infinity and stuff like that. Um, and mu. So I'm going to just say a bunch of words and then we'll see what they mean. So mu is a, a positive Borel measure. on R3 uh, with whose support is, uh, so the support of mu is equal to B. Okay, good. So certainly we have no difficulty understanding um, that B is the set of points occupied by our body. Um, and what mu does is it returns for us the uh, uh, sort of inertial uh, information about, um, um, about the system. So it's kind of the mass distribution. And um, uh, positive because a mass is a positive quantity generally. Okay. Um, Borel measure uh, means uh, it means that uh, what uh, this thing mu does uh, is that mu um, so uh, mu of a uh, returns uh, the mass of a um, for any Borel subset A. Okay, so if you don't know or did know but forgot or did know but 
didn't care sufficiently to store it in your memory what a braille set is so it's just a collection braille sets are a, a collection a sigma algebra a collection of subsets of uh, euclidean space and that's the sigma algebra generated by the uh, uh, open subsets of r3 so to construct braille sets you take open subsets take complements so closed subsets and then you take countable intersections and unions of those things and then you take complements and countable intersections and unions uh, um, that's how you get the sigma algebra of Borel sets. Okay. Um, doesn't really matter so much as we'll see. Uh, uh, this just um, the idea of defining um, uh, mu, uh, the mass distribution, as a, a, a positive Borel measure. What we're going to see is that this is going to allow us to um, model particles as uh, rigid bodies. That's the whole kind of point here. Okay. Um, and uh, support of mu equals b means that points outside b have zero mass. Okay, and that's consistent with the idea that b is the set of points uh, in space which are occupied by the body. So if the body doesn't actually physically occupy um, um, some region in space, then the mass of that region uh, corresponding to the mass distribution of the body should be zero. Okay, so the best way to understand the definition is to immediately just jump to examples. Okay, um, so let's take uh, a particle. Okay, so as I said, the whole idea of this is that a particle is a rigid body. Um, so uh, let's see um, um, how that works. Okay, so the particle is going to be located at some point uh, x naught in R three. Okay, uh, so what this? Uh, so I need to give you a b and a mu. Of course, b is you know this my physical idea about what b is is the set of points in space occupied by the body while well, a particle only occupies the point where it is which is x naught okay and mu so if i take any uh, borel set and, and we don't need to let's uh, fuss too much about exactly how how deep your understanding of what borel sets are but some subset of r3 which has some properties Okay. Um, uh, so, what should the uh, uh, um, the mass? So, mu applied to a set A returns the mass of the set. Okay. Um, what should that be? Do you think? I will await answers to this question. Okay. So, what will the mass of a subset A of R three be? Anybody? Zero if x naught is not an A, and then just some value if. Yeah, the, the mass of the particle if it is, exactly. Thank you. Okay, so it's equal to m. So m is, you know, whatever, some positive number, which is the, the value of the mass, um, if uh, x naught is in A and zero otherwise. Okay, so that's how a particle, and so um, uh, this is the uh, uh, Dirac measure. And so you may have seen uh, uh, um, Dirac functions or something like that as distributions. Well, this is a very related concept. Um, uh, called Dirac measure, okay. Right, so the, the mass is concentrated at the point uh, x naught is, is the point. Okay, so particles are rigid bodies. Good. Um, let's uh, step up the level of difficulty unimaginably to two particles. Okay. 
Okay, so the body obviously is going to be uh, x1 and x2, and that's, we're going to assume, of course, that x1 is not equal to x2. And if I take a subset, A of R3, what's its mass? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Like M1 plus M2 if they're both in M1 if only one is M2 if the other is M0. Yep, thanks. <clears throat> okay, and so I'll leave it as an exercise to uh, uh, come up with the way in which um, uh, some finite number of particles is a, is a rigid body. Okay, um, so the other example you can think about is, so this is kind of a, a, a two kind of degenerate examples of rigid bodies. And so um, a non-degenerate, And all rigid bodies physically are, of course, non-degenerate. So particles actually don't exist. They're just idealized mathematical models. So, you know, every rigid body is non-degenerate. But let's see exactly how, what that means. Okay, what it really means is, is that, uh, uh, so we have some uh, B in uh, R3 and we have, and so mu uh, is the mass distribution. And so the way you normally think about a mass distribution um, um, is you think about a function, or let's call it rho, the mass density. Um, uh, and rho is a function on R3. Non-negative. And uh, you know, typically it's continuous, although it doesn't you know have to be continuous if your body is made from uh, two different kinds of materials at the point where the boundary of the materials uh, uh, coincide, coincides, then uh, uh, you'll have a discontinuity of the mass distribution. Okay, so you know it should be you know, integral. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, so first of all, the support of rho uh, should be equal to b. And again, so this just means that the mass of uh, uh, um, particles should be uh, as, um, as zero off uh, the set of points occupied by your body. Um, and then the mass distribution b, or sorry, mu, uh, is going to take a set a, and it's simply going to integrate the mass distribution over that set. Okay, and so uh, uh, x here is uh, in R three. So I'm doing, you know, this is a um, a, multi a multiple integral. Okay, and so you know um, that's that's the normal kind of rigid body that you talk about, and that kind of has uh, uh, it's sufficiently arbitrary that there's typically not much you can say about that, and we'll see what that means as we go along. Okay. All right. So those are some typical examples of rigid bodies. So rigid bodies, it turns out. So, it, um, so once you have a rigid body, what kinds of properties does a rigid body possess? So it turns out that rigid bodies are characterized And what exactly characterized means here is something we'll talk about, um, uh, but they're characterized by uh, three things. 
their mass, their center of mass, and um, their inertia tensor. Okay, so mass and center of mass are maybe not difficult to think about what those might be, but we'll define them carefully. Okay, so um, of uh, the mass of a rigid body. B, you know, is of course, uh, you just integrate um, uh, the measure uh, mu. And you can integrate it over B or you can integrate it over all of R3. It's the same thing uh, because the support of the measure is contained in B. Okay, so uh, um, let's integrate over B. Okay. All right. Um, so that's what the mass is. Uh, um, okay. You can also write that. What about the center of mass? Oops. The center of mass of a rigid body. is xc. Okay, so xc is defined like, like this. Okay, so we're going to integrate. Uh, let's integrate over all of our three here. Um, and so we're going to integrate uh, a function. Okay, so we're going to integrate a function with respect to um, the measure mu. Okay, and so again, we'll see in practice how, how this works uh, for, for simple examples anyway. Okay, uh, so we're going to the function that we're going to integrate is a vector function, and the vector function is the vector function x. Okay, um, so I'm going to integrate that vector function uh, uh, um, over uh, all of our three. Okay, so I'm integrating now um, the measure uh, uh, this this function of x with respect to the measure, and uh, I need to um, divide by uh, the mass. Okay. All right, now, so let's look at these two simple, so the inertia tensor we'll talk about at, at some length, it's a slightly more complicated thing. So before we do that, let's look at, uh, uh, let's look at these two things um, uh, for the examples that we worked out uh, above. Okay, so for a particle, all right? So the mass, <clears throat> um, and so a particle, remember, is defined by uh, uh, a mass distribution, which looks like this, okay? And so uh, the mass of the body is just going to be that. Um, and of course, that's just M, okay? So the mass, oops. All right, so that's not a surprise. Uh, what about the center of mass? Okay, so let's uh, work that out. So the definition is it's one over M integral uh, uh, over all of our three. And I'm gonna integrate the function X D mu of X, okay? All right, so without actually, you know, necessarily fully understanding exactly what, uh, sorry, is there a question? Or is uh, that just... Okay. No. Somebody has their microphone on. Oh, okay. I didn't know. So that's good to know. Okay. All right. Bye. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Um, uh, 
Uh, okay, so uh, um, without sort of really going into uh, the full details of understanding what uh, how, how to actually do that integral, we should be able to figure this out, okay? So we're going to do an integral uh, of the Dirac measure at x naught. And so if you're going to integrate a function with respect to the Dirac measure, and so you kind of know uh, if you've seen the uh, Dirac uh, function as a distribution, you know how that works, right? Uh, it takes a function and returns the value of the function at a certain point, right? So if you apply that same reasoning to this, what will the value of this integral be? Okay, so remember that uh, the Dirac function or the Dirac distribution that you, I assume that you talked about this in uh, 335 or something, most of you at least. Right, and so you know you could also talk about the uh, the Dirac distribution was a at some other some random point t naught. Okay, you know if you apply so the function what's the function phi here? Well, the function phi is just phi of x equals x, right? That's that's the function. So what's that integral going to be? Anybody? M M X not. I'm sorry. Say it again. M X not. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, so you know, uh, uh, at the point X not, it returns the value M. So you know, it's the 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 Dirac, but it's it's weighted by M, um, and so this is going to be one over M M X not, which of course is X not. Okay, so that's life is as it should be. The center of mass of a particle is um, the position at which the particle is located. Okay, so now we have, uh, uh, so um, first of all, of course, if we have two particles, the mass is uh, M1 plus M2. Okay, and the center of mass by the definition Okay, and the reasoning here is rather the same as in the previous case. Uh, we kind of have a sum of Dirac's, one at x1 uh, and, and one at x2. And so when I do this integral, it's going to return the sum of uh, uh, the things that I got up here. Uh, so that's going to be um, um, m1 x1 plus m2 x2 over m1 plus m2. And it's maybe slightly better written like this, just to make it uh, a little clearer what it is. Okay, and so you see that uh, the center of mass, um, so this uh, quantity plus this quantity, of course, is one. And so uh, the center of mass, therefore, is going to be some point. So if x1 is here uh, and x2 is here, if you think about it for a second, just for the very reason that the sum of these things is one, what that means is uh, uh, that the center of mass is going to lie on a line segment between x1 and x2, okay? Um, and, you know, if m1 is uh, larger than m2, then it's going to be closer to um, uh, x1, okay? And so it's kind of a weighted uh, 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 um, um, you know, the, the distance between x1 and x2 is weighted by the proportional masses, okay? Okay. And so you can, again, 
and you might want to try to actually figure out what the general expression uh, of the center of mass um, Okay, so it's relatively easy to deduce uh, what the center of mass of um, some finite collection of particles is. Okay, and so for our arbitrary non-degenerate rigid bodies, rigid body, well, M is, you know, whatever it is, um, Do the integral somehow. Okay. And there's not much you can say about the center of mass either. Um, all you can say is that it is what it is. And you have to look at every uh, example um, to try to figure it out. So in this course, so, so you know, those of you who have sort of a you know engineering mechanics background will know that there's you know tables of centers of mass for all kinds of different things, which are you know all obtained just by doing that integral. Okay, but for for this course, we're always going to stick to uh, examples of uh, rigid bodies uh, uh, for which these things are pretty easy to deduce. Okay. All right. Um, so that's two of the three things that characterize a rigid body, uh, its mass and its center of mass. Um, and the third thing is kind of the more interesting thing and requires uh, uh, thinking about. We will do that. And it's the inertia tensor. And the way you, as, as we'll see, uh, the way you can think about the inertia tensor is it's ra rather like the uh, uh, rotational mass. Okay, so you know uh, if you're talking about planar motions, you're you've been familiar with this. You call it the moment of inertia, um, uh, but we're not interested just in planar motions. We're interested in kind of arbitrary motions in uh, three-dimensional space, and so the inertia tensor is a, a somewhat more complicated object in that case. Okay, so here's how you define it. Um, uh, so first of all, what is it? Uh, and so I'm gonna talk about the inertia tensor um, about a point. About a point X naught, okay? And as we'll see, so that point X naught can be taken anywhere in R3, all right? Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a point in the body by, uh, by any means, you can take the inertia tensor of uh, uh, of a particle about you know a distant point. Uh, that absolutely makes sense. Um, uh, but we're going to very often uh, take inertia tensors about the center of mass. But before we get there, let's do the general definition. Okay, so about a point x naught. Um, and so, what is um, the inertia tensor? First of all. Um, so it's a linear map from R3 to R3. And how is it defined? <clears throat> so I X naught um, at a vector U in R3 is going to be defined by doing this integral. Okay, so this uh, symbol here is the normal vector cross product in R3. Okay, so again, I'm integrating a function of x, right? So x is the variable here with respect to which I'm integrating. And so I'm integrating with respect to the uh, mass distribution of that quantity. Okay, so um, uh, 
that's an integral generally that you don't want to try to do explicitly. What we'll do is we'll try to get at understanding what the inertia tensor is by examining some uh, properties of this definition. Okay. And the properties of this definition uh, will allow us to sort of write down inertia tensors for, for the simple kinds of rigid bodies that we're going to talk about in this course. And if you have a rigid body that's more complicated than that, um, then probably you need to determine its, uh, its inertia tensor experimentally, okay, which, which there's devices for doing that, um, or you know, maybe numerically by trying to you know, um, model the rigid body in some kind of a um, um, you know, design type package and you know, ask, ask it to calculate the inertia tensor. Okay? But we don't want to get into that things at that level of detail. Okay, so properties of the inertia tensor. <clears throat> um, so the first thing, um, all right, so uh, um, I x naught is a linear map from R3 to R3. Okay, so R3 has a, 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 its standard um, inner product, the Euclidean inner product, okay? Um, and it turns out that the inertia tensor with respect to this standard inner product uh, is uh, symmetric. Okay, so remember when we talked about um, uh, um, symmetric bilinear mappings, right? We had a little side conversation uh, that symmetric bilinear mappings are not the same thing as symmetric linear mappings. To talk about symmetric linear mappings, you need to have the structure of an inner product. Well, we do. Uh, we're in physical R3 space, which has uh, a, a physical inner product that we've already used, for example, to define um, uh, or our um, uh, spatial and body frames as orthonormal bases, okay? So, so we're gonna use this, the um, physical inner product structure of, of uh, space, okay? And with respect to uh, that inner product, um, Ix dot is symmetric. And I'm going to denote the standard inner product by G R3 for R3. Okay. So this is a rather straightforward calculation. Um, and for the calculation, we're going to uh, recall, and maybe it's not a recollection. Um, there's some ident an identity about inner products and cross products that we're going to use. Um, and the identity is, is this. Okay. <clears throat> um, and so you just take uh, uh, this expression, which involves the inner product of a cross product, and then you sure shift the entries to the, uh, to the right to get that. Okay, and you know, to prove that you can, for example, just calculate it. And both all cross products and inner products are things you can calculate, so you can just calculate it. Okay, but that's true, and we're going to make use of that. All right, so we do a little calculation. And here's the calculation um, that we're uh, going to do. Um, so to show that something is symmetric, uh, what you have to do is you have to take its inner product or you have to take the inner product of um, the linear map applied to a vector, let's say u, okay, um, right, u1, and you have to take the inner product of uh, this with u2, and what we're going to prove is that this thing is the same as the same expression if you switch the places of u1 and u2, and that's what it means to be symmetric, okay? So we're just gonna calculate now. Okay, so we're going to go G R3 of, um, uh, okay, so um, let me, uh, when I write this down, it's going to look a little bit prettier if I actually write the uh, inner products are symmetric, so I'm actually going to write the U2 first. Okay, um, and then I have the definition of the inertia tensor, which is uh, all this stuff. Okay, 
So it's um, integral over R3 of x minus um, x naught cross u1 cross x minus x naught uh, d u x. Right? Okay, so that's just using the definition. All right, so now I'm going to use linearity of the integral. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the inner product of this thing with, uh, uh, with, with U2, and I'm going to move it inside the integral. Okay, good. Uh, so now I'm going to um, apply uh, this vector identity. Okay, and I'm going to take, I guess, uh, A to be equal to that, and B to be equal to that, and C to be equal to that. Okay, um, and it turns out after you do that, what you get back is, uh, is this. So you get u uh, two cross x minus x naught um, inner product with u one cross x minus x naught. Okay, so so if you just sort out all the symbols, uh, that that's what you get. Okay, um, and then I'm going to do uh, the same thing. I'm going to apply the vector identity again, um, but I'm not just going to do it in the way that undoes what I already did. I'm going to do it in such a way that uh, um, here I had uh, U2 sitting all by itself, and so I want U1 sitting all by itself. And so that means I guess that I'm going to take in this sort of expression here, I'm going to take C to be uh, U1. Okay, so I do the, the vector identity again, and you get this. Um, and so now I can do the linearity trick again, and I can pull uh, the uh, uh, inner product outside the integral, and you know, sort of not um, not writing that step again. Uh, I simply get that this is uh, um, g r three of um, q one i x naught of uh, u two. And that's that's it, right? That's how you show that something is symmetric. You show that if you take the inner product like so, of one uh, and apply the linear map to u one, um, it's the same thing of the inner product with I applied to u two. Okay. Now, uh, because as we know, uh, symmetric uh, linear maps have lots of properties, right? So we when we talked about this um, when we. Again, we're talking about symmetric bilinear maps before, um, and we were comparing them to symmetric linear maps. So what we talked about there is um, I uh, x naught has uh, real eigenvalues. Okay, and we're going to call those uh, uh, I I one. And we can order them. Okay. Um, and also, a basis of unit eigenvectors. And sorry, uh, an orth orthonormal bits. Sorry, let me write it all down properly. Um, and an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors.
Okay, um, and these things have names. So the eigenvalues are called principal inertias. And um, uh, eigenvectors are called principal axes. Okay. Um, and so the principal inertias and the principal axes really tell us what the inertia tensor looks like. Um, and what do I exactly mean by that? Okay. Um, so let's define uh, the inertial, uh, what's called the inertial ellipsoid of, um, of a rigid body. And it's going to be um, a, a subset of R3. And um, it's going to be a subset of R3. Uh, and I'm going to write the points in R3 not as XYZ with respect to the standard basis. Okay. I'm going to write uh, the uh, points in R3 uh, with respect to um, a basis of eigenvectors. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take a point at any point in R3 and I'm going to write it as uh, x1 um, u1 plus x2 u2 plus x3 u3. And I know that every point in R3 can be expressed uniquely in that form. Okay. Um, and, the, uh, and, and the coefficients of the point in R3, x1, x2, and x3, uh, should satisfy some condition. And the condition is uh, this. Sorry, I'm uh, I'll just write it down here where I have space. Okay, so that's what the inertial ellipsoid is. All right, so uh, uh, the idea is that the inertial ellipsoid inertially looks like your body. Okay, that doesn't mean that it physically looks like your body. Your body could be a very irregular looking thing. Um, and so if we were in the room together, I would pick up a chair. A chair looks nothing like an ellipsoid, um, uh, but a chair has an inertial ellipsoid. And the idea is, is that inertially, uh, uh, that chair, although it's quite irregular, inertially, it's the same as its inertial ellipsoid if its inertial ellipsoid you know, has some sort of a, a homogeneous mass distribution. So it's, uh, uh, the mass distribution is kind of constant inside the ellipsoid and zero outside. Um, uh, uh, and so um, for um, certain purposes, you know, obviously not for sitting on, uh, but for certain purposes, you can replace the chair with its inertial ellipsoid. And the certain purposes are you know, the dynamic behavior of the thing. So in other words, if you take the chair and sort of throw it up in the air um, and watch it rotate, it will rotate as if it were its inertial ellipsoid. Okay, so that's what I mean when I say uh, um, it suffices to know um, the mass, the center of mass, and the inertial ellipsoid. What I mean is dynamically. Okay. Um, okay, uh, so um, all right, so I think I'm going to stop there because I want to talk about some things which uh, I shouldn't break in half. Uh, so we'll finish there. And so next time, um, <clears throat> uh, we're going to talk about what are called um, axes of symmetry of rigid bodies.
Um, and that will allow us to actually sort of write down uh, uh, inertia tensors for a lot of the rigid bodies that we uh, that we're going to look at. And so we'll look at some examples of, uh, of rigid bodies. Okay, so we'll stop there. <laughs>